Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. You're in the middle of a three-part UFO whistleblower series. This is part two. Today we have DC Long, an Army combat veteran who witnessed a hovering monolithic structure in an underground facility on an Army base. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you see, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Go to Spotify and Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, and for those of you that are content creators, we've seen you guys pulling our content off of our episodes, and we really appreciate it. We made it easy on you. There's a link below. It's got hundreds of raw reels that you can take, download for free, make your own content out of it, monetize it, make money. All we ask is you tag the show. Love you all. Enjoy the content. See you soon. DC Long. John. Welcome to the show, brother. Pleasure to meet you. So we met also at uh, Dr. Greer's conference in DC with the, whiff the Whistleblower Conference. And um, I just want to say it's an honor to have you here. I know it takes a lot of courage to come out and talk about what you're talking about after so long. And... Um, we're here to get your testimony of what you saw out to the public. What are your goals? It's an honor to be here, first of all. Uh, we spoke earlier downstairs. You know, it can't be pushed further. I mean, it's, you have to give yourself more credit because I wouldn't be alive. I wouldn't be sitting in this chair if it wasn't for you. If it wasn't for the people that you've had on before. I, you know, when I had no strength left, I just happened to come across it, and uh, yeah, you're the really reason I'm here just as much. So I'm my glad goals you are reflect here. your goals. I'm, I'm glad you are here, and uh, I'm glad the show helped you. It's helped a lot of people, and and I said it before. I'll say it again. You know, one of the main things we do here is we want to bring hope, especially to vets. You know, overcoming all the trauma that has gone on for the past twenty years. And it will come again, you know, and document history, tell truth, expose corruption, and again, bring hope. And you're a perfect example of that hope. So thank you for saying that. that I appreciate it. But now, before we get too sentimental here, mm -hmm. I want to give you an uh, introduction. So D.C. Long, you're in the New York, uh, excuse me, D.C. Long, you're in the U.S. Army, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 1997 to 2013 was your service medically retired from injuries received from a combat jump. Your father was a government contractor also at Fort Bragg. And you had a encounter with a what we call monolithic slab hovering off the ground at range 19 at a secret underground bunker. And so we're here to document that testimony. Um, before we get started, everybody gets a gift, <laughs> even you. <laughs> and uh, here you go. Thank you. The only thing I brought you was me. That's all right. That's more than enough. <laughs> You're what it's all about. Thank you so much, man. That means a lot. You're welcome. You're welcome. So those are Vigilance League gummy bears. Is it legal? They are legal in all 50 <laughs> states. We actually got an email once. And somebody sent me a, somebody sent us an email and they said, man, I'm on my third bag and I still don't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, dude, <laughs> you're not supposed to feel anything. They just taste good. But, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. But, um, so we're here to get your eyewitness account on what happened on that day. When was that? When did this happen? That happened in 2011. At the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, when I was still in Fort Bend, Georgia. Were you still active? Yes, I was. Um, and incidentally, it, it had nothing to do with my military career. Anything that I did um, in service had absolutely nothing to do with it in the sense that, uh, as you said, my father was a government contractor. And um, on occasion, I had a 30% stake in the business. So... He would ask me to help him out whenever I could. So I took leave. I 
came back down uh, to Carolina to help him out. Uh, that day, the day in question, he was in the 18th Airborne Headquarters, G5 War Room. Uh, what he was doing there, I didn't ask. He didn't tell me. But that's where I met him. Uh, he told me that we were going to get an escort from JFK Warfare to take us over to a place called Range 19. Uh, is it thundering outside? It is. Right. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you'd set me up. But, um, where was I? I apologize. You got selected to go to Range 19. Yes, sir. Yeah. They called us. Uh, he called me up, said that we had an escort coming from... Uh, JFK Warfare to meet us and take us to a place called Range 19. Just real quick, what was your dad's business as a contractor? It was turnkey. Uh, originally, it started out doing residential and commercial construction from the monolithic slab to turnkey. Everything was subcontracted in house. So, it's whatever you needed, um, as long as you had plans. It was construction. Right. That was that was the main purview. Just Why do you think you guys got selected to do this? Well, as long as my dad was there, uh, he's always had uh, hunting land in North Carolina, and a lot of the guys from group that he met there would come down to his land, go hunting with him. A couple of the Delta cats that he knew take us on their planes. We go down to Arkansas and do some duck hunting. And it's all over the U.S., uh, Montana. Uh, Colorado, Mesa, elk hunts, bear hunts. Yeah, it's just the guys who were into it, that's how they got tied in. And he did submit everything that he did through the Army Corps of Engineers. That's uh, where he would submit all of his uh, bid submittals for the contracts, you know, like uh, the Force Com building that they built on Fort Bragg. Um, he was responsible for the top three levels of it. And, um, but, as far as how he got tied in to do the work around McKellar's Lodge um, during the FS, uh, excuse me, SF compounds, I have no idea. Um, we didn't talk about that in okay. that sense. So, yeah, I just assumed it was the guys that he had met, and I they knew got him well paper, enough they just got not the bids ask questions. Where it needed to go. Say again. They got the bids into where it needed to go. Right. Okay. And it's not like it was a public bid. You know, not everyone could, yeah. because I imagine there were things that they weren't supposed to see, and we just weren't naturally curious people. So it's not like they had to worry about us saying anything. Yeah. Um, the day that I met him up there, uh, like I said, the escort comes to meet us. Um, it's one of the guys that he knew that he had hunted with. Um, I didn't know that this gentleman. Um, but they pick us up in a, a van. We get in the back of it. They take us out about 15 minutes. And I could tell it was going towards the direction. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Fort Bragg. I'm not. Okay. It's, it, there's only one direction you can go to get to the live fire ranges to get to the drop zones and things like that. So I assume we were headed towards Sicily or Normandy drop zone because that was the direction we were going. Um, the van that they had us in, it didn't have any windows. You couldn't see to the front. It was just a cattle car. And we were joking they were going to take us away, ask him what he did, and we're going to head to Leavenworth for a little while. But uh, we get there, and as soon as the door opened, it, it looked like a literal dump. There was just trash everywhere, not like people just leaving stuff out. It was an actual dump. That was a 45 degree concrete door setting out of one of these hills that was directly in front of us, no further than you and I are to each other now. And uh, so we go inside, meet another escort in there, uh, take us to this freight elevator. We get in there, two series of buttons, didn't have any writing on it. Um, one of the guys looks at my dad and says, saying to both of us, yeah, keep your head down, your eyes on the heels of the man in front of you, or you'll be shot. And we kind of started giggling because, you know, at least I knew that one of the guys was one of his buddies, you know, people that he used to hang out with. And the other guy, I recognized him as the guy who we'd went hunting with before. Um, I knew later on that they were 
uh, both Delta operators. Um, if they were still active, I have no clue. Do you know their names? I do. Do you want to no, say their names? Absolutely not. Okay. And I'll I'll tell you later why. But yeah, hell, hell no. <clears throat> so you're seeing familiar fa- you're seeing familiar faces, which makes you comfortable, right? And you don't realize how the shit storm I just stepped into. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely not. What what exactly were you guys there to do? What he told me was that we were going down below ground to set up a shoot house. Uh, okay. An indoor live fire range that was going to be underground. Nothing new. Again, yeah, I, I didn't think anything of it. We had done other uh, shoot houses before with the open tops that can be viewed from above. Mm-hmm. With a catwalk. So, yeah. It, so it just, it didn't. Didn't even phase you. It was just another day at work. Okay. And I was just there to help him out. But we get down, uh, the doors open, and uh, the first thing I see are these personnel connexes off to my right, the the smaller ones, not the the larger ones uh, that you see scattered around or like the ones you'd see on a, a big rig carrying around. These were the small ones. You would throw your personal gear in to go before you get shipped overseas. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, as soon as I I looked past them, I could see this giant monolithic slab just sitting there. Um, at first, it didn't, you know, once again, it, it didn't set off any alarms. I didn't think much of it, but the closer we got to it, I could feel this intense vibration. That, and, but uh, you couldn't hear anything. It was dead silent in there. Uh, the The loudest thing was the the footsteps. That I could hear, and uh, what what did the vibration feel like? It felt like being at a concert, standing next to one of the speakers, and without the bass the noise. just permeating through your body without the noise. There was zero noise, zero just vibration, absolute zero. I could still hear myself breathing over this, but inside, it was such a strange feeling to have so the closer i got and i was like well i gotta check this out so i go down to one knee you know the fact and i gotta tie my boots and then i glance up underneath it and there's absolutely nothing underneath this damn thing nothing holding it up whatsoever what did the slab look like it just looked like a, a granite slab but the sheen on it is is what caught my attention the most it was kind of in between being polished or just completely translucent. There was something behind it, but you could tell it had a smooth surface to us. And the only lights that were on in that hangar that we were in were directly over our head where we were walking through that walkway. And how big was the slab? Oh, God. It was about 20 foot long. It was about seven foot tall, and I couldn't tell how wide it was. By that point, I was already directly in front of it. So there's like, absolutely, it would be impossible for a human to even think about picking something like this up. Oh, there's no way. Okay. Even with the construction that we've done, if you had to pick up something like that to move it anywhere, you would need at least three, four cranes. Oh, wow. Herrera could tell you better. Okay. Yeah. You know, the the scope of equipment that it would take just to get it off the ground, you know, not even to transport it to a uh, another location. But uh, at this point, I'm still down on my knee and I'm looking, and behind it, I can see two people standing. The only thing I can see is their feet, but there there's this boulder directly behind it, and it's on the ground. And I glance over my shoulder, and there's a guy with his back turned to me standing in front of another boulder identical of the other one that I could see up underneath the monolithic slab, and he's just pushing it with one hand. And then I assume he's pushing it in the other direction because it's just freely spinning, no wobble. It's like it was attached to the top and the bottom, and it was paper mache. That's how easily this guy was just spinning it around. Wow. At this point... Um, the escort behind me kicks me in the back, says, let's go. So we get up, keep going, go down uh, a flight of stairs. That's when we get to what we call the shoot house. Um, you could see old lanes where they had actually used it before as a live fire range underground. And um, we'd probably only been down there 
15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, maybe. Father was taking notes on the dimensions, what we needed, what I guess he understood what they wanted. Um, and I know that we had to replace the walls. It's inconsequential to the story, but we had to replace the rubber on the walls for the uh, shoot house. And in that amount of time, we go back upstairs, exact same route that we took on the way down, and everything's empty when we get to the hangar again. Everything, the, the two boulders in the back, the monolithic slab, all of it is absolutely gone. And it was, we weren't, you know, 100 yards below these guys. We were just one flight below them. So whatever it was that they were taking out, we would have heard it. it you, even the uh, the people making noise around it, you would have still been able to hear. But it was dead silent. Like I said uh, before, there was nothing in there. Just our feet. But coming back through, it was absolutely gone. Everything in there just vacated. And at, at that point, it's... How much time had passed? Less than 30 minutes. Less than 30 minutes. Because it, it didn't take us long to do what we had to do downstairs. And, and this was just an assessment. You guys weren't actually, you weren't any, you weren't doing any construction or repair in the walls. None whatsoever. Anything. It was just a hey, it this was is just, what we need to do. So there was no equipment that you were operating that would have that would have muffled any sound that was going on above the right. Take the measurements, layouts. You. The loudest thing was the you know the tape measure we were using. You now uh, that a roll tape and a notebook. That was it. That was the only thing that. Um, that was the only thing we had down there. I don't know if I've ever been this excited to represent a brand. I'm talking about First Form. I just align so well with what they've got. First Form is a supplement company. They have just about every supplement you can possibly imagine. All grade A stuff. Let's go through some of the stuff that, uh, some of my favorites. All right, here we go. One. Enduro Performance. This is a non-stimulant pre-workout mix. Guess what? Made in the USA. Protein sticks and the protein bar. Look, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm super busy. I don't have time to go to lunch. In fact, I don't even know what a lunch break is. This is my lunch for the most part. Then we got Opta Reds 50. Guess what? Also, Made in the USA. So is the protein bar and the beef sticks, actually. But Opta Reds 50, guess what, guys? Beets, super healthy for you. Guess what? They taste like shit. This doesn't. Two scoops, throw it in there. You get all the benefits of having beets with Opta Reds 50. Then we've got protein. Everybody needs protein. If you're not taking protein, you should be, especially if you work out. My favorite, chocolate banana. Guys, let me tell you something else about First Form. The owner, CEO, Andy Frazella, guy has made a phenomenal company. True American Dream story started from absolutely nothing, sleeping on a mattress in the back room of a very small shop. Now, he's built an empire. Check it out. Go to firstform.com slash SRS. He's also put a culture into his company that this entire country could use right now. Gave me a ton of inspiration. I used to listen to his podcast, Real as Fuck, when I was building my first studio in the attic of my house three and a half years ago, right when the show started. Can you believe that? Now I'm repping the brand. And if you haven't checked out their podcast, you might want to. Like I said, Real as Fuck. Check it out. I'm actually on there. I do a pretty decent job, but uh, let me know what you think. Anyways, once again, go to firstform.com slash SRS. And when you get there, if you order $75 or more worth of product, guess what? You're getting free shipping, but you're only getting that if you go to firstform.com slash SRS. That's one S-T-P-H-O-R-M slash SRS. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a real American company that aligns with all the values that America stands for. Check them out. Why are people investing in emergency food supply kits all over the country right now? The answer is because it's 
tensions continue to escalate in our country, our very fragile food supply chain is going to wind up failing again. That means you really need a proper supply of emergency food on hand before the disaster strikes. You'll breathe easier knowing you can feed your family in a crisis. Go to preparewithshawn.com for your one-week emergency food supply. My Patriot Supply is the nation's largest preparedness company with millions of happy, worry-free customers. It comes in a nifty ammo can that's loaded with delicious foods. There's no skimping on these meals, offering 2,000 calories per day. Don't skip the special $30 in savings available this week only on the one-week emergency food supply. Go to preparewithshawn.com. That's preparewithshawn.com. How how far away from the slab did you feel the vibration? Did you feel it before you saw it? No, no. Whenever we that uh, when the the doors of the freight elevator open and I looked down, I could see it. Okay. I could, yeah, I mean it was no farther than yeah you know, from here to that camera pod, I mean, six seven feet away from me. Whenever we were walking in, but oh, what made that- me stop? It was that close. Right. What made me stop was as close as we got. I noticed that in front of me with my dad and the other escort in front of him, it was almost like hopping a tripwire. You know, when you're on the trail, you just get it and go. And that was the first thing I noticed. And then the closer I got to it, that intense vibration. And I was just too curious. Yeah. I I couldn't stand it. I had to figure out what it was. And, um, I really shouldn't have. When did the vibration stop? It didn't stop until I walked away. Okay. In the center, at looking at the top of it, you could see this black box. Um, I've tried to describe it before, and it was extremely difficult. It just looked like a, a small black GMTK toolbox that a military mechanic would have or carry around. It wasn't very big, and it just had two leads that came off of it, and it looked like it was wrapped in a casing that you could almost see something inside of it, but it wasn't mechanical. It wasn't moving. It didn't have lights. It was just opaque, but it didn't really seem to serve any purpose. But that the other boulder had the same thing on top of it. But so are you, hold said, on. I'm sorry. Are you no. saying you saw two boulders and a slab? Yeah. And they were and all three of them at the same time. The the slab itself, the monolithic slab, it was about 12 to 15 inches off the ground. Okay. And whenever I knelt down to tie my, tie my shoes, I could look through it, and I saw the first boulder that I noticed, and it was just sitting on the ground. Okay. And then I glanced back, and the, that's when I saw the other boulder that had the same black box on top that was being moved around. And that was that was levitating? Yes, so one boulder was levitating, three. one slab levitating, one boulder on the ground. Correct. Okay. Did the did the slab have a black box anywhere near it? The monolithic slab? Yeah. It did. It did? Where yeah. was that located? It was on the top near the center where I was feeling most of the vibration. It was like the closer I got to it, that's where it was the most intense, at the at the center of the slab, where that box was on top of it. Okay. Keep going. And after that, um, we go back upstairs the way we came, like I said. We get out of the door to leave. Fans still in the same place. We hop back in. We take that same 15-minute drive back to uh, 18th Airborne Headquarters. Uh, They gave us our phone back. I got my ID. And then my dad said something to one of the other guys that uh, I recognized that he knew that I didn't I didn't know his name but um, that guy took everything that my dad had you know, minus his phones uh, he, he took the notes he took the tapes everything uh, from him there and and uh, 
I didn't think much of it at that point. I didn't know if that was something he was going to submit to the Army Corps of Engineer rep that he had, whoever was going to coordinate, you know, or give him the go ahead to submit a bid to do this project. Yeah, so to me, again, that didn't set off any bells. Um, we're getting ready to leave. Uh, as I said, let me back that up. Before we go and get our phones and our identifications, um, the second guy that I recognized, the one that I, I do know, he was upstairs in the G5 war room in the 18th HHC. And it's just him sitting at the desk as soon as you go into the vault. And he's got two pieces of paper. And he's like, I need you to sign this. And it was a non uh, an NDA. And I was like, fuck that. I'm not going to sign that. Come on, man. Really? It's like, you know me. I don't give a shit. And uh, my dad just kind of played it off to the same thing. He's like, man, I'm not signing that shit. So that's whenever we leave. At that point, I'm getting ready to go back to Georgia. Uh, this is roughly 24 hours later. I get a phone call. It was one of my dad's employees. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? I was no, nah, not much. Just headed back to work. He said, well, we can't get to work. So what do you mean? He's like, well, everything, they called it the barn where we had all of our equipment stationed, where they would meet before they would go to, to uh, Fort Bragg. He said, the barn's locked up and everything's gone. This is the same day? No, this is 24 hours later. Okay. Whenever I'm getting ready to go back home. And um, I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, everything's gone. So I try to call my dad. I can't get up with him. I was like, just stand fast. I'm coming down there. So I get down there, and like you said, the barn's locked up. Everything down there that I could see, I mean, you can still go there to this day. You could see our staging area and how big it was and all the equipment that we had there. It's absolutely barren. There's nothing there. It's all gone. And my dad at the time lived just around the corner from there. I go up there to his house, and the door is kicked in. And like the video I showed you earlier, downstairs, uh, I did that to illustrate how close me and my father were. Because just telling the story from this point on, it, it, it sounds inconsequential. But like, oh, well, sons and fathers have problems all the time. It's no big deal for bad blood to, you know, to take over. And just people can be too much like each other, bullheaded, and not be able to communicate. And that's why I showed you that so you, you could see what kind of I mean I've called the damn guy my hero because yeah. he was uh, but uh, I get in there and my dad's sitting at his couch and his office is just to the left of his living room and everything is torn out everything is gone and I was like what's going on man he's like it's all gone I was like do you think this has something to do with range 19 and he stood up that man you saw, and he said, don't you ever fucking mention that name to me again. And that was the last time that I got to spend any time face-to-face -face with my daddy. Yeah, but... I'm sorry. It's, uh... Uh, a life, a business, everything that we built together. And I, I got no answers. I had no excuses, no reasons, no answers whatsoever. Just unreturned phone calls. The few times I ever did get a chance to speak to him, it was only my voice being heard. He'd just hang up on me. He'd hang up on you? Yeah, yeah. I didn't... My God, it wasn't until... 2021 that I, I got to see him again I didn't get to he would just refuse to see you yeah absolutely and uh, yeah, it made me wonder what, what could somebody threaten you with to make you turn your back on your own child I don't know how many children you have but I killed for my country what in the hell do you think I would do for my babies
And I'm his only son. I'm his legacy. Every loan from the beginning of time to me is if it stops with me, then that's where it stops. But he gave me that. To us, that was important. And, yeah, I cut my ties. I, I just, I let it, I let it go where it, it's so hard to talk about, man. But, and, uh, let's get back to, to my part of the, that affects my career and why I was retired. It was, uh, mm. is your dad still alive? No. He's not. When did he pass? November 10th, 2021. How? Well, that's, um, they said that he had aggressive cancer that they found late, that um, he was just ravaged. It was all over. And, um, I know shit happens. As I'm no stranger to that, with our careers and all, all the guys in this room, none of us are strangers to to things happening. We have a better way of accepting it than most people do, I think. But not him, not like that. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't. I don't get into that part of life. It's just even some of it to me that I'm aware of. Irrefutably makes me feel like it's just absolutely insane. But I will never believe that my father died of cancer or natural causes. A man is as big and as powerful as him, not because he couldn't have been taken. We're all measured. It was just he was healthy. And then in two months, he went from being 240 pounds to 105. Wow. Just, I mean, when I, they, called me and told me that he was in the hospital and I went to go see him. I walked by his room twice. I, did, I just, honestly, the first thought that, that crossed my mind is that, man, I, I feel bad for that guy. That sucks. And then when they told me that's who it was, you know, I went in and he still couldn't even look at me. And, and I don't know why. And I just, you now I, I took his hand. I said, look, man, I don't even know if you can talk. He had the chemo scars or some look like, I assume, were chemo burns on his mouth. It was just these gnarly burns on his face. And his eyes were just cracked with jaundice. And I was like, man, we're square. I don't care what happened. I love you. And a tear went down his cheek and... I was asked to leave. Uh, he started to code, and that was the last time I saw him. You know, it's shortly after um, the incident. It was in uh, late 2011, early 2012. I'm, uh, I've already been JMPI kitted out for a combat jump. Got the full pack, got the 1950s weapons case dangling. And uh, I was the first man in the stick. They gave us, you know, told us the, the 30 second sign. We're all hooked up and ready to go. The jump master's got his arm up, getting ready to hit me in the back. And then we see shuffling. And I'm only one of 12 guys that I jump with every time. Uh, it never deviated, no change. That was my team. It didn't matter if it was Conus or Conus. Those were my guys, only 12. <clears throat> and a guy from the back shuffles his way to the front, and it's one of the escorts. He is unmistakable. You can't. I mean, really? You, you know. Yeah. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry LeSeur, CBS News correspondent, and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek magazine. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd.
Antarctica Treaty of 1959, an agreement signed by 12 nations in which the Antarctic continent was made demilitarized to be preserved for scientific research. What do you think about that? I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this Earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. He was also previously contracted by Raytheon Polar Services as a cook to work on a cat train that went across the ice, and he said the express purpose for him, I should say, for that team, working for Raytheon, was they were searching for missile site locations. They find out it's really usable not only to live in, but militarily. And at first, it didn't, it just didn't connect with me. It, it just, you know, I just gave him a, hey, how you doing? And he just winked at me. As soon as that, that John Master's arm came up, and the green light's getting ready to go off. No sooner than it hit, and I felt his arm coming down, I feel something slap me on the side of the face, and it was a static line. And that man took off out of the aircraft. And when he did, it snapped my neck. And it pulled me out upside down, deployed my combat gear, long story short, at a complete oscillation, and I just smacked the ground, and I woke up a month later. Career's over. And I'll tell you something else. It's Do you something. mean you burned in? Yeah. Your chute didn't. Oh, well, my what chute. happened? My chute deployed. But whenever I fell out of the aircraft, and I think maybe we were jumping from 800 feet, if I had to guess. That's what it looked like from the, the, the horizon. But whenever he hit me going out of the aircraft and the static line went taut and it snapped my neck and I fell out of the craft, I'm not even sure how I fell out, but it deployed my lower end line on the way out. So whenever my canopy did open, it just started a complete oscillation. Okay. I remember looking down and seeing daylight and just smack and it was over. You think that was an assassination attempt? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was. And the only reason I tell you that is because when my father died, not even a week after I buried that man, I'm at my, our new house at the beach. Nobody knew I'd been there. I hadn't even changed my driver's license over. I hadn't even told the VA that's where I'm living. Not even a week after that man was buried, I get a knock at the door. It's that same guy who cut me out of the door, hands me a note. It said, thinking of you, he's like, hey, sorry about your loss, buddy. What would you do? And Dr. Greer asked me, he said, well, did you feel like they were trying to intimidate you or they're trying to hurt you? Absolutely not. If that was the case, I would have never seen it coming. To me, it just felt like somebody looking you dead in the eye and said, I can touch you anytime I want. And then it, everything started flooding back, and that's what led us to here. I wrote out that entire story to Dr. Greer. You you fell out, and it I'm, it was a week after you buried your old man, you said? Or the day after? I'm sorry. Whenever he showed up? Yes. That was a week after I okay. buried my father. At Rudy Marist Cemetery in Dublin, North Carolina. Nobody knew I was there. Nobody. So this is this is 2021. Yes, just a couple of years ago. Yes, and you still and this happened. When was the accident? When was well? When was the assassination attempt? 2011, 2012. Did you it's recognize honest, him? I've got it written down everywhere. It's so hard to remember. That's when I got this. Yeah, and ever since then, it's just been fuzzy. And that's what led us to this. That, that scared me so damn bad that I had decided I wasn't suicidal. No, please don't get me wrong. I was not depressed. I wasn't. I just felt like at that point that it's not about me. I've got my children. If something happens to them, it's my fault. So I figured if I quietly recuse myself, 
who's going to know better? What's it going to matter? My story's over. Get to see my dad again. And hopefully save my kids from this bullshit. Because it, everything changes. It's one thing when you lose your brothers. It's one thing when you lose your family. But if you worried about losing your children, that's that's taking it to a whole nother level. Yeah. You know, just because we choose to be peaceful at this point in our lives does not mean that we forgot how to be violent. I'll take the whole damn world down to protect those kids. And I know you would do the same for yours. Yeah. But what stopped me was you. Are you in contact with your mom? No. Is she alive? She's alive. Was she still married to your dad when he passed? No. Was she still married to your dad in 2011 when this happened? When the when you witnessed the monolithic slab? No. No. No contact. No. And unfortunately, I I remind her a lot of my father. And it's nothing against her. We still have a great rapport. I mean, I'm I'm 43 years old with everything I've been through. I still blow my mom a kiss whenever I leave her. It's not like, you know, we did the same thing my dad did. It's just I know <clears throat> how painful it was for her to lose him. And hearing me speak, you know, we have the same eyes. Do you and guys I, ever I, talk about this? No, no. Was there any communication from your dad to your mother that you're aware of. The only way she's going to know about any of this is by watching the podcast. Okay. All right. But, you know, and that's, I'm, I'm ashamed, absolutely ashamed from being too afraid to keep going. You know, it's, I didn't even bring up the homeless bit because I did it to myself. It wasn't some crazy circumstance that I could blame on anybody else. It was my fault because I was afraid. So this destroyed your life. You're damn right it did. I'm still I'm still trying to rebuild. You know, but I don't I don't ask anybody for anything. I don't it's not about that to me. You know, it's I lost all familial contact whenever I lost him in that sense. I mean, the, the war is bad enough watching your brothers go through what you feel like you should have went through. You know, I can't speak for everybody, but survivor's guilt tears me up every day. Now, if there's one thing I hate myself for, isn't not trying. It's just not giving enough. Uh, I can't. The, the names I say at night when I go to sleep, the man that I think about, I just, I miss him so damn bad because those guys, I knew that they would die for me. Some of them did. And the one safety net that I had here was him. When you went to, it was just you and your old man that went to Range 19 that day? Or were there any other, did you guys have any workers with you? No. Just you and your dad? Just he and I. What do you, why are you coming forward? Why, did, why are you coming forward to, to, to educate the public about what you saw that day? Same thing I said at the press conference. I'm damn tired of doing nothing. You know, I can take losing my career. I'm fine with that. I didn't think I was going to do it forever. I'm fine with losing material possessions, but one thing I will not stand for to watch people in this country just hand their freedoms over and think that the government's doing them a favor. Watching my brothers who would rather be homeless than have to deal with the bullshit that got us there in the first place. And it's not because we're afraid. It's because we don't feel like we did enough. We feel like we're just putting our burden on other people. And that's something that they don't deserve. You're willing to die for people who don't even damn like you. To me, that's absolutely fucking insane. But that's just the kind of people that we are. And it wasn't until I heard something that Herrera said, our oath didn't expire. Good damn luck taking this shit off my neck. 
right now somewhere there's a little kid sitting somewhere across this world and he's got his grandpa's combat boots and one day he's going to be old enough to fit in them and if we sit back and do nothing if we do not do, lead by example they're going to think that it's okay just to be quiet I think for too damn long, good Americans, it doesn't matter if you're a combat vet to me. It doesn't matter if you didn't shed the same blood that I did. What matters the most to me is good people who believe in the flag. That one sitting over there that so many people died for, the one that was flying over ground zero, the sacrifice, whether it was a false flag or not, that flag is important to me. And I'd be damned if whatever life I've got left, I'm going to sit there and be quiet about it because there's a big fight. And if we do nothing, the bad boys are going to prevail. They're going to take over. And I don't think we want that. This world could be so much easier if they would just let it out. But somebody wants to make money off of it. Well, I commend you for your courage, man. That means a ton to everybody that's listening. And um, I know what that takes. And I just, I want to say, man, I'm I'm sorry about your old man. I'm really sorry to hear about that. And, and um, yeah, but he'd be damn glad that you wouldn't let me go all the way. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> glad you're here, buddy. But, Do you have anything you want to say before we end it? Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.